All right, we have one more speaker uh, today in this session. Michael Payne will be speaking. Uh, Mike graduated from the, just this past spring from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh uh, and with a bachelor's degree in statistics, actually. And he's currently a master's student uh, in the stat department at CMU. He has strong research inter interests in baseball statistics, clustering in general, and small area estimation. So let's welcome Mike. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, like, uh, you introduced me as um, Mike, and I'm a master's student at CMU. And today I'll be talking about um, automatic clustering of pitch effects um, data. And we got a little introduction um, in our first talk today uh, about the pitch effects database. So um, we'll really be diving a little deeper into that um, um, today. So this is some joint work I've done with Andrew Thomas, uh, my pr professor and advisor, um, Rebecca Stortz, another professor in the stats department at CMU, and a grad student, Sam Ventura. So just kind of give a little bit of a background of what I'm doing today. Um, I'll first kind of start simple. We'll um, build from the ground up on just some basic background information on baseball and um, pitcher background. And then we'll do a little pitch effects introduction, which it was very helpful to see that earlier. So hopefully that helps. Um, then we'll actually get into the automatic clustering technique that we'll be introducing and proposing. And after we do some clustering, we're going to label the pitch types um, with the names that we um, normally correspond pitch type to. And then the new thing that we've just recently developed is a current clumped application. The clumped is just the name of our method. And if you guys want a little teaser, you can go to this website right here and test it out as I'm talking. Won't be offended. Um, so we really hopefully can get some feedback um, with how that's going. So just to kind of visualize the results for everyone. Oh, okay, there we go. So just starting off simple, um, just in general, a pitcher's goal during a game is to throw a pitch and try to get the hitter to miss or hit the ball poorly. And they do this by changing the speed and movement of a pitch. So here's an example. This pitch is a, fa a fastball where it's moving fast in a rather straight direction. You see the movement went rather straight. And then the next example, Jared Weaver again, um, changing the speed and movement. Um, look for just you know, kind of a drop in the pitch. You can see he fooled the hitter and he swung and missed. So that kind of leads us to a little bit of background of baseball. And the whole goal of the pitcher, again, is to make the batter miss or hit the ball poorly. And the pitcher does this by varying the speed and uh, the spin or the movement of the pitch. And in general, pitchers throw a variety of different pitch types, like we saw too um, before. Um, and you can kind of see them as a spectrum of pitches. They throw fastballs, which are faster um, with low movement um, in the horizontal and vertical directions. And then they throw maybe a curveball, which has less speed but moves more. So another point to kind of really stress is that pitchers throw a different subset of pitches um, depending on their kind of role on the team, their arm strength, and their ability. Um, two different types of pitchers in baseball are starting pitchers and relief pitchers. Starting pitchers usually start out the game and throw as long as they can. And relief pitchers come in later and you know, usually throw for shorter amounts of time. Um, two examples are Barry Zito, he's a starting pitcher. He throws five different pitch types. Oh, Craig Kimbrell, he's a relief pitcher, and he only throws two. So in general, during a game, the pitch type is unknown to the batter. The pitcher during the game determines what pitch he's going to throw you know, every time, and the batter doesn't know what's coming. So as a result, there's no official record, at least publicly, that is recorded of what actual pitch type was thrown. So our whole goal here is to identify this pitch correctly. And why do we do this? Why do we care? Well, if we have this improved data, these improved, you know, that's a fastball, that's a curveball, you can really answer a lot of other baseball-related questions. Maybe, you know, what hitters perform better against um, fastballs or curveballs. Um, maybe you can detect a change in a pitcher's repertoire and predict future injury. Um, there's really a lot of numerous questions you can answer with improved data. And again, kind of stressing the, the types and the, the things the pitcher can control is the velocity of the pitch, and then the side spin, which is the movement of the ball in the horizontal direction. So it kind of be, you can see them as kind of the same thing, side spin and horizontal movement. And then top spin, which is the ball spinning in this direction, and it controls the vertical drop. So those are three variables to keep in mind. So like we got introduced to earlier, um, PitchFX is available publicly. So we're able to actually get this pitch by pitch data. 
And like we saw, it's uh, manually recorded in every stadium, and we have our own version of the database working. Um, there's over 30 variables that you know, vary from velocity, release point, acceleration. And in our particular database, we have data from 2008 to 2013. There's over 1,000 pitchers. Every um, pitcher throws from 100 to thousands of pitches each, uh, depending on how long they were in the league for that span of time. And like we heard earlier, um, Alan Nathan has actually re-derived some of these variables. So we've replicated that work, and we've created back and side spin in our database. So here's just an example subset. Um, every row, row corresponds to one pitch. So you can see Barry Zito, you know, the, the first row is one pitch that he threw. Goes 89 miles per hour, spins with a certain revolution. And then PitchFX itself actually tries to give a label to this. And our whole goal is to improve that label. So just basically, what are we trying to do? We want to identify groups of pitches with similar characteristics using the features of our database. And then after we identify these groups, we want to put a label on top of them, the fastball label or the descriptor of the pitch label. So here's an example of the current MLB neural networks method or the current um, method that's used in the raw database. And the plot here is a three-dimensional plot of the three variables I was talking about earlier. We have side spin on the um, z-axis, start speed on the x, and then top spin on the y. And in general, let's try to see here. Um, it does an okay job, but there's some obvious misclassifications. Um, in general, right here, this is the fastball cluster, two fastballs right here, the fastball cluster, and you can see that it's labeling some of the fastballs, um, sliders, and there's just some obvious mistakes, and it's rather known that this method is imperfect. So something I don't have here is there actually is a really good current method um, run by Brooks Baseball, and they actually manually label every single pitch. So every single day, they go in and look at the pitch effects data and manually label every pitch, and that's a whole lot of work. And um, they'll do some things from look at high resolution pictures, picture, pictures of a pitcher's grip to try to see, oh, was that a curveball, was that a slider? And they also will talk to a pitcher to say, hey, what did you just throw? So there's a lot of work that goes into it. And our whole goal here is to actually automate that whole process and hopefully do as well as Brooks Baseball does, um, just save a lot of time. So kind of breaking down the way we have to attack this problem is we want to identify groups of pitchers with similar characteristics. And we need to do this because we don't have any truth data set. We need to use an unsupervised clustering approach. So we try out a variety of different methods, um, k-means, hierarchical clustering, and model-based clustering. And we kind of see this as a two-step approach where we cluster the pitches for every pitcher. So we'll take Barry Zito, cluster all of his pitches, take Tim Wakefield, cluster all of his pitches, et cetera. And we do this because it's able to adapt to pitcher-specific characteristics. Tim Wakefield's fastball goes only 78 miles per hour, but you know, Craig Kimbrell's might go 98 miles per hour. And then after we separate these clusters, we're going to assign them a label. So your typical fastball label. So here's the first method we tried out, a really common clustering technique, and it's k-means. And you can see it's actually not working very well. Um, there's some obvious misclustering going on there, and we were able to easily rule this uh, method out. So another common clustering technique is hierarchical clustering, and this is average linkage. Again, it's not doing very well. So we kind of went back to the drawing board, and we tried to pair a statistical technique that actually fits really well in the baseball paradigm. So what we did was we came up with, or we found model-based clustering, which is a multivariate Gaussian model um, to fit each pitcher profile. And this kind of setup is rather intuitive. And the reason behind this is the model-based clustering with the mixture multivariate Gaussian model actually is trying to fit a normal, to try to find a normal cluster, a normally distributed uh, cluster in the data. And if you think about baseball and the elements of a pitch, is let's say a pitcher throws a fastball. In a perfect world, he could repeat his motion every single time with the exact grip, the exact movement, but we have external factors like we learned. Uh, there's wind that controls it. Maybe they change their grip slightly. They can't repeat their motion. So what we see, and you can see it in the past clusters, is rather normally distributed clusters. And this method takes into account that and is actually looking for that exact kind of description in the data. So we think it's a very intuitive approach to how to, you know, how to attack this problem. So here's an example, the model-based clustering. So there, it actually isn't doing very well. And the, one, the reason behind this is the model-based clustering itself doesn't have a way to determine the number of clusters. So we did this in R, and it has a default cluster number selector, and that is ba the Bayesian information criterion. And so as you can see, it, whenever the clusters are clearly separated, the light blue cluster up there, it kind of captures everything. But whenever you get the clusters that are close together, like the fastball cluster here on the right, 
it splits it up into very skinny clusters, which isn't, you know, isn't doing well. And that's not necessarily a signal of the model-based clustering not working, but merely just the method of choosing the number of clusters or choosing the number of pitch types that's not working well. So we kind of went back to the drawing board, tried other cluster number selectors, and again, we reached back to the baseball intuition and what method makes sense to what we're seeing. So we've um, actually developed our own criterion, and it's a kind of an adjustment to the Bayesian information criterion. So what we know is, going back to the fastball example and the random noise around it, is because you have an ideal um, speed and trajectory and movement, there's random noise around it, so we shouldn't expect high correlation among in, inside the actual fastball cluster. And what we see here, oh, we see here is actually some high correlation among these variables, and that doesn't really fit the intuitive approach. We should see clusters like this where there, you know, the ran, you know, no correlation within this actual cluster among top spin, start speed, and side spin. So what we did was we actually penalized four clusters that have a high correlation. So as a result, this lowers the number of clusters that are chosen. And because it fits the intuitive approach, we, we thought we would do pretty well, so we went and tested it. So this is Barry Zito, again, and it does much better. So you still have the nice, clearly separated clusters here, and then it separates the fastball cluster into two clear, um, separate clusters, the four-seam and two-seam fastball. So overall, and we tested this on many more pitchers, and um, it does a really good job at um, separating pitch as well. So I started checking out some more examples, seeing if this method held up, and I came across John Lester. And I looked and I said, oh no, this is making a mistake. And I looked particularly at the curveball cluster up here and it was splitting it into two different pitches. And I said, oh, that's a problem. But I looked closer in the data and I found that the purple cluster is actually John Lester's curveball in 2011, and the black cluster is actually his curveball in 2010. And I found this really fascinating because this method was able to detect just a slight change of slight change in his profile. Um, even though their overlapping cluster is able to almost completely separate, separate out the two years. So you can see that it varies. His uh, curveball in 2011 got slightly slower, and I think the horizontal spin also changed a bit. So that's a really nice advantage that the other clustering methods or other classification label systems don't have. We're able to detect the same pitch type change over time. And if you check out our app, you can see like a pitch like Matt Garza, his fastball is changing over time, and it separates you know, fastball clusters along, and you can see the change. And it's a really nice feature of this method. So going back to the actual cluster number selector that we're doing, and um, we use both criteriums in all pitchers, and we randomly selected 50 pitchers, and in all 50 cases, the BIC adjusted, penalizing for correlation, um, performed better than BIC. And BIC you know, really just blew up the number of pitches they sent a pitcher through, and not very accurately. So we were able to conclude that, at least for this application, um, the baseball application with the intuitive approach, BIC adjusted, outperforms BIC. So next, we have our well-separated clusters. And um, so, but we don't actually have a pitch label to it. So we need to develop a way to actually label each pitch type. So I initially, just kind of on my own, developed a heuristic decision tree algorithm that labeled clusters based off of you know, the typical pitch types. So, you know, if the pitch is the, the fastest cluster, label it a fastball, and then if it moves so much, label it a curveball, and it does decently well. But um, one issue that we have is, you know, if you go ask a pitcher, say, what pitch do you throw? He might tell you a slider. You know, we might say it's a curveball, and the catcher might say it's a slurve. And it's really hard to really identify what does each pitch mean. So, just recently, we've been working on a new way to label pitches, and Definitely want to hear people's feedback on this because this is new. Uh, we've been talking and collaborating with Dave, Fan, um, Dave Cameron at Fangraphs and try to get some of his ideas. And we kind of label pitches in a different way, more descriptive of how the pitch actually performs. And we split each clustering space into eight groups. And then we label the pitches based on where their cluster falls. So instead of a fastball label, we might call the pitch a fast rise. Um, slow drop would be curveball, slow left, slider. So instead of being controversial and saying, no, you actually throw a curveball, and he said, no, I throw a slider, we just purely describe what the pitch is doing. Now, again, this is, we would like to hear feedback on if this is good, because people do like the typical um, labeling methods, but you know, we can always combine the two, or you know, whatever suggestions or feedback you have, um, it'd be really appreciated. So we took all the, these results and we made an application. And I'm not sure if any of you actually went to it, but I'll try to pull it up now. Yeah, there we go. 
So hopefully the internet cooperates. So this is a way to kind of let everyone use our method, see the results of our method, and display everything in an interactive way. So this is using some technology, WebGL, that just was released about three weeks ago. So this is a really um, prototype. And so any suggestions you might have in making it easier for people to read or use, um, it'd be much appreciated. So here's the plots we've been looking at on the right. And you can see you can actually move the cluster around. I'm not doing a very good job at this on this laptop, but you can move it around. You can see the actual cluster object around. So what's kind of cool is if you subset the data, which is an option on here, even if we don't detect the John Lester different cluster separation, um, you can see if there's changes within the cluster. So if you subset, let's see right here, even though if we have this full, oh, sorry. Sorry, this is David Ardsma. I can pull up a different picture here. <laughs> yeah, someone named, I'll go with Barry Zito. That's the example we've been looking at. Yeah, so you can type in anyone. There's a drop down menu, or if you know the guy's name, you can type it in. There we go. So this is all of his pitches from 2008 to 2013. You can subset it down here if you'd like. So, so not only can you see, you know, it varies, you know, and probably isn't the best example for it, but the John Lester situation, you can see the pitch evolution across time. But you can also, by subsetting the data, you can see pitch evolution within cluster as well. So it's kind of cool. Um, some other features of this is you can change how dark the cluster object is, the ellipsoid around it. You can change the point size. Um, one another cool feature that I personally like is increase the point size of the last game. So it'll make the point size for his last um, start bigger. So you can see if a pitcher's coming back from injury, you want to see how um, the pitchers perform. Now, this is a lot of data, so it might be hard to kind of see them here. But try this. Yeah, so there's a lot of interactive features here. And if you guys have any suggestions, play around with it. If you see any issues, we're still tweaking the algorithm and also tweaking the visualization. Um, there you go. So you can see the bigger points are his last, game, uh, his last start. So you can see where they fall. So play around with it, and hopefully um, I can talk to you guys and see if you have any suggestions. Yes, I will bring it back up. <laughs> OK. So first, I'll just talk about some conclusions here. So we developed a new criterion for choosing the number of clusters that's BIC adjusted, which is a statistical method, a new statistical method, and it fits well with this baseball paradigm. And we've also hopefully improved the clustering classification of the MLB pitch type data. So some current and future work. Um, this, um, these data and these results actually will be available in some sort on fan graphs, hopefully within the, past the next couple months. So everyone can have access to it. It doesn't, you know, not just on the URL. And we're currently fine tuning and updating the clumped method and the application. And so any suggestions are definitely appreciated. And also we hopefully, and I've actually started exploring some, you know, other research questions. We're taking this improved data, you know, trying to maybe cluster pitchers um, into separate groups. And there's some interesting stuff to look at there. So here's my contact information. There's a version of the paper available at that URL. And then the, cl the clump prototype um, URL is right there. So feel free to write that down and send me an email if you have any suggestions or any weird things that you find you know, are wrong. And, and yeah, thank you. Time for a couple questions. Let's start over here on the right. Given the previous presentation, how does this do handling knuckleballs? Knuckleballs. Oh, yeah, we can actually pull that up probably. So what's interesting is it actually, I think, splits up the knuckleballs into three different groups and three different types of knuckleballs, which we thought was rather interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how it separates it. But if you just cluster one of his years, you'll just get one really large cluster. Um, it's actually in the paper. Um, here we go. This might be a little hard to see. So I'll show this, and then I'll show a static plot of them as well. Oh, too big. But um, you can see the big cluster in here. So it actually is splitting it into three regions. And so you got a pitch here that has lower backspin to it, the green 
the green cluster. And then you have a cluster to the right, which is the black cluster. And it is, it has more right spin to it. And the purple cluster has more left spin to it. So it kind of splits it up into two different ranges. And we'll try to plot it by velocity here. Looks like there's a red cluster there, too. The slower pitch and the faster pitch, maybe what you were talking about. Um, so this is all of his data, so it obviously changes a lot over time. If you want to just look at a plot of him for one year, this is probably a clearer example of Wakefield's knuckleball. Um, it handles high variance as well, but um, if you want to detect those subtle differences in the knuckleball, you can enable to do that. Or if you like the more classical approach, you can you know, take this. So it handles high variance clusters rather well. Time for one more question. Do you know if there's any um, variation in pitch FX data for like a fastball based on the count? So if I'm, if I'm trying to waste a pitch outside versus trying to strike something out, is that going to have a difference in characteristics? Um, yeah, so I mean, in order for it to be labeled as a completely separate cluster, if you have a, um, a substantial amount of data, you're going to have to have a lot of pitches that are complete waste pitches. Um, it usually does a really good job of capturing the outliers around it. So if you have a fastball cluster, it's still going to have, it might be out in the one corner, but it can capture that pitch rather well. It's never, I haven't seen an example where it makes it its own cluster. Um, yeah, but it, it does a rather good job at handling waste pitches. All right, well, let's thank Mike again. And just a couple points. Uh, there is now, I believe, lunch being served, sandwiches and snacks. Uh, and if you want to watch the parallel session, the video will be posted online on the Nessus website. Uh, I don't know when that'll happen, but uh, hopefully within a few days. So thank you. Enjoy lunch. Yeah. You're obsessed with the same thing I am. I'm not a I'm the chair of the science and baseball committee centers. Oh, I'm